This is WPSL Port St. Lucie, the talk of the Treasure Coast. Seven oh seven at WPSL fifteen ninety, the talk of the Treasure Coast. You're on Ask a Rabbi, and this is Rabbi Shafir Loeb of Congregation Eitz Chaim, your Jewish home on the Treasure Coast. So, yeah, welcome, and it's another one of those beautiful Friday mornings outside, and we are working our way through the Omer, which is the counting of the barley harvest between the festival of Passover starts the second day of Pesach and goes until Shavuot or the giving of the uh, the tablets. So among all of your plants and stuff in your backyard, no, do you have do any barley? Have barley. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that question. No, I do have, a, we've got some wonderful, wonderful plants coming for the next plant sale. That's as good a thing as any to mention, and that is the 30th of May. Ooh. It's during the holiday weekend, and we're going to be putting flags inside the little flags so that people might buy some plants and take them to the cemeteries on Memorial Day. That is very cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so that's awesome. Going to be doing that, and uh, hopefully people will be able to you know, use some of the plants to beautify the, the, the grave sites. Got a question for you. Sure. Yesterday we did a show with Dr. Scheip, and we were talking about National Prayer Day, which used to be a big thing, no mm-hmm. matter what the religion. I mean, it just it was a big thing in Washington D.C. It is almost unheard of this year. It well, it's because it's hard to you know, it's hard to get big gatherings. It's one of the things well, that congregations are doing right now on the on the rabbi service. You know, uh, the list the li- the rabbi discussion boards and one of the big discussions is are congregations going to offer quote-unquote normal high holy day services in september which happens to be labor day weekend this year just because god has a great sense of humor um (laughs) yes and uh, you know what can i say but the question becomes you know are people going to want to sit through that length and that quantity of service masked and social distanced because even though the CDC is likely to adjust the rules by then, are individual congregations going to want to? That's it. Boy, what a question. Yeah. So That's a, lot a of, heck of a question. Right, a, lot of que- a lot of congregations are asking their membership, you know, what do you want this coming year? Do you want to gather uh, and have to wear a mask and, and minimal singing and da-da-da-da-da, which is you know, pretty much what we did last year? Because we did it virtually, but I mean, there was singing, but it was different. And, you know, how, how are we going to integrate that this year? That becomes a really big question. So, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. Wow. That, <laughs> yeah. I no. didn't think about that. Right. And it's... recognizing, right, now our congregation doesn't have a, a, a big. Um, right. Right. Yeah. Well, we, and I mean, we don't have a big choir. We don't have a lot of. My fo- my philosophy has always been it's about prayer, not performance. And so, you know, there's not a whole lot of showmanship and practice and that sort of thing. But for the bigger congregations that do have elements of that or significant quantities of that, that's going to be bringing in a whole different piece. Right. We think of that choir where, you know, the bulk of the choir got COVID because one person had it. Right. And. You know, the pressure that is often put on even volunteer choirs to show up, even if you're sick, so that we can practice, you know, and there's a pressure, there's peer pressure there. You know, how does that translate into our our COVID era? I never thought about that. Yeah, so there's, there's a whole number of things to look at in connection with that. Um, are, are religious leaders going to travel to congregations? for leading services at some of the smaller congregations that don't have a full-time rabbi but they have one for the holiday periods 
And of course, uh, you have to wonder uh, if all of a sudden you're talking about High Holy Days and say the temple is in India. Whoa. Now what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. In India, well, no, and that, I, that's I, I don't an think example, in India, I don't think in India there can be any choice. Yeah. Oh, candidly. yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there are congregations. There are Jews in India. So. Yeah. Well, and in. In just using India as an example, I mean, it could flame up anywhere. It can, uh, you know, and it certainly has. Sure. The one thing I'll note, though, is that India, as horrible as that story is, their percentage of fatalities is amazingly low for the number of infected people and the shortage of hospital space and oxygen. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, they... They've been running around three, four thousand deaths. Yeah, and still a huge number. It's still but a yeah, huge yeah. number, but when you're talking about billions of people, right? It's it's not as big a number as it sounds. Right. And and that's one of the challenges with numbers, which is trying to keep some perspective. It's it's a per capita thing, it's a percentage thing, and yes, it's tragic for any number of people to pass for certainly. any reason. Certainly. And I'm still going to bring back St. Lucie County loses an average of almost 100 people a day for a variety of reasons. So, you know, losing several hundred to a disease is significant, but it also is not. And it's very catastrophic for the people who are touched by it and their families. It's. You know, th- th- this is it's going to take decades to sort through all of this and the real impact of COVID. Yeah, and I agree. I it's it's just it's very confusing. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And 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 it's it seems like you know, of course, uh, obviously now people have had a little time. They're going to sit there and blast the CDC for not knowing what they're doing. Well, yeah. But, yeah. But, just you know, uh, just as people blasted the. Um, the airlines and airport security for 9-11 right. when such a thing was never pondered or considered. Right. You yeah. know, people should have a, a magic a crystal ball. As we, you know. No. Yeah. There are things that you can't prepare for until after they happen and then you know not to let them happen again. And even that be- is a challenge. I'm, I'm, I'm astounded at some of the things that have been stopped in their early stages in their inceptions. And how many such things happen that we don't even know about? Oh, yeah. Well, right. you know, I, I, I know, um, well, this former basketball coach who coached against IRSC, and uh, he was a Homeland Security guy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, confidentially would tell us stories that would curl your mm-hmm. hair. Yeah. And this is all stuff that had been stopped in its tracks mm-hmm. by Homeland well, Security. And there again, as you mentioned, 9-11, an outgrowth of that mm-hmm. was Homeland Security. Yeah, well, that was a that was a re right. And, you know, there've always been guard, border patrol for right a long, long time. You know, and recognizing you know a couple of things about that. A lot of the folks who are undocumented workers and have overstayed their visas came into the U.S. on work visas and just stayed, or they came on tourist visas and stayed. Right. And, you know, so they become undocumented, but they enter the country legally. They don't enter the country illegally. Most people do not swim the Rio Grande, at least not today. And, you know, that, that's not to say that there aren't people who do. There are people who go across the wall. There are people who go through tunnels. Definitely drug cartels run people through tunnels. And tunnels are, are much more challenging and much more prevalent than people realize. And the wall's not going to stop a tunnel. No, definitely not. You know, <laughs> and, and, you know I've uh, seen some of the television shows. Some of those tunnels are really, some of them are, really elaborate. Yeah. Some of them uh, rival in the Brooklyn, uh, the Brooklyn Tunnel. The, uh, oh, the Holland Tunnel the or Holland something tunnel, like that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Brooklyn Bridge, thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, nobody's gotten, as far as I know, brazen enough to put a bridge over any of the walls. Uh, you know, in different places, people don't realize that there's the wall is an interesting phenomena, and 
I don't know if it was around when you were in Tucson, but it certainly was when I was there. The oh yeah, the No Mas Muertes. Yeah, right. Because people, immigrants wanting to come to the U.S. for whatever reasons they're wanting to come, usually it's a better lifestyle or escaping some horrible situation where they are and hoping that the U.S. will be better for them. And being victims all the way along the route, typically. But they have no perception of what the Sonoran Desert is, particularly to cross by foot. Correct. Oh, and, yeah. you know, <clears throat> the Nomas Muertes group uh, puts water tanks out with, uh, with flags, blue flags on them, so that people don't die, right? <laughs> it's a horrible death in the desert. And... You know, that's what the Nomas Huertes is, is, is about. So, yeah. Yeah, we used to see so much down in Nogales, Arizona, which is the sister city of Nogales, Mexico. Right. And, you know, it's, oh, yeah, yeah, all yeah. the time. Yeah. So it's, uh, that's a, a treacherous piece of, of real estate. And the border has been there for a very long time, and it has not been open for a very long time. It, it you know, you go through check gates, but, but I have no idea how many people come across, but either going into Mexico or coming into the U.S. The borders are always busy. They were busy in the '60s, right? When, when I knew about them. So yes, you know, back in the days of the dinosaur, um, <laughs> or, or when I was at KVOA in the '70s, it was the same yeah. way. And actually, the border crossing in Ajo. Uh, which was way west of Tucson, um, was just a little gate, a swinging gate. That was it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it, uh, of course, led out into the uh, Papago Reservation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's the other piece that a lot of people don't realize, that some of the, the nation land uh, spans the border. It's, it's Sure does. You know, you're going to put a wall and separate half of you can't quite do that, you know. It's you can't go through somebody's backyard, and, in the middle of it, and separate half the family, which is what the wall, if it <clears throat> would have been put up in those areas, would do. And as we both know, that sometimes there's a slight lack of respect for the uh, nations, <clears throat> yeah, in the Southwest. Yeah, yeah, it's a slight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, we we it's, violated every possible treaty there is. And we're still doing it. That's the really tragic part. Yeah, yeah. Right? We're, still making, we're still making new treaties that we then turn around and violate. And we wonder why there's such a bad relationship. Hello. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I had to do, a, for my PhD in psychology... I had to do a paper on psychology within some group. And there were a number of different populations. And the one that I ended up doing was American Indian psychology. There is actually a section of APA specifically dedicated to American Indian um, psychology, looking at how many American Indians become psychologists, and how many of them serve uh, reservations or areas with high density of native populations and when I turned my paper in which was a, not an easy paper to write uh, you know got a got a good grade on it but the comment that the professor put on top of the paper was I cried your last pages are wet uh, it's tragic it's sad it's very very hard for somebody on the reservation to get to grad school to become a psychologist. Oh, I would think so, yeah. There is minimal facilities, and there certainly are not easy internships on native lands, and, and it's just the system is really stacked against them. And that means it's stacked against us, because when any group is not being served with proper medical care, and that's what psychology is. Psychology is medical care for issues that are psychological uh, as a folk posed to cardiovascular or you know some other system in in our bodies and uh yeah and you know you all 
everybody has seen the stories of alcoholism on the reservations mm-hmm. and stuff like that and you know it's it's uh, so needed there right and it, and it's not because they're they're american indians it's alcoholism because of the socioeconomic depressive environment and we see it not only on reservations and among american indian populations but you see it all over the planet for the people that are at the bottom of the totem pole who don't see a way up and out and you know they they don't have very many coping mechanisms that are offered to them by the culture or by society and so alcohol unfortunately is it's a sedative and so it does numb you to some of these things but only temporary of course and it's self-medicating which is always dangerous because you almost never get the dose right and then you mess up all kinds of other things and it, it's, it's a spiral sure. sure um yeah it's just you think about that that would be an extremely difficult paper to read yeah. i would think oh it, it it was a difficult paper to write and um, I'm, I would have been crying had I been the professor grading it. So I totally understand because there, you know, I didn't project any great solutions because I was like, this is, this is so broken. <laughs> the system is so broken that it needs a really radical, radical disruptive innovation to change it up. And God willing, that may happen but it's not going to be easy. It's going to take somebody with a lot of vision and a lot of fortitude and a lot of determination. And those kind of folks are not, <laughs> they're not a dime a dozen to, to use all of the, the phrases. Well, realistically, with the folks that you see in government now, I would say that that would be slim and none. Yeah. It's, it's harder and harder. I, I think back, by the way, one of my friends in Tucson just said, uh, truth as I visited chariot work on the res in Ajo. Oh, okay. So there's to your comment. Um, thank you for that comment, Cher. And yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah, and, and I've got friends who live out in Ajo that I do uh, communicate with from time to time, folks that I knew from Tucson who moved out to Ajo to, to work with some of the issues out there. Also, to get away from the city of Tucson. <laughs> yes, which is growing. It is growing. It's, quite a bit. Uh, yeah, almost as much as Port St. Lucie. Mm, it's it's the amount of construction in the Tucson and the Northwest is just beyond. You you wouldn't recognize it if you went back. Oh, there. no, no. I haven't been there in years, yeah. so I would imagine yeah. I just wouldn't even come close to recognize no. it. Oro and Valley I, is... Uh, Oro Valley was probably three houses and... and uh, right. And a javelina <laughs> and back a, then. In a dream. Yeah. 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 And now it's as commercial and as paved as you can imagine. I would be fascinated to see um, if there was time lapse of Go to watch it. You know Kit who, Peak. You I know? was going to say Kit Peak does that. They, they have, do? They have a picture. They have a series of pictures showing even in Tucson, which has dark sky mentality not like port st Lucie that doesn't care how much light pollution we put in the air but tucson you know monitors and regulates that you're not allowed to have upward shining light and they consider oh, dark. i didn't know that there are there are very serious nighttime light restrictions with the idea of kit peak and even with that kit peaks becoming unusable in the direction of tucson things. yeah they're still very good in the other directions where it's still quite dark at the reservation um but not in the city part of tucson yeah and they do they have pictures showing you the amount of light pollution growing as the city grows and as it and as it moves up the mountains which is even sure. a oh, bigger yeah. issue right because if you've got a living room light shining out your your window and you're 500 feet above the city you've now raised the light pollution and the city's feet. already at 3500 feet right. so yeah oh yeah. yeah 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 visual telescopes are losing their their efficacy over time because of the amount of light pollution in in america in general 
And so the dark sky is a recognized resource. That'll be all right when uh, Elon gets us to uh, Mars and we'll just start all over again. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we'll have light pollution of many types <laughs> in Mars. Uh, you know. Well, Who knows? Well, you know, what amazes me is, you know, we're sitting here uh, batting a bunch of ideas around down here and watching that video of that helicopter, NASA's helicopter flying on Mars. And I think back and you think, my goodness, how far we have come mm -hmm. at NASA to do actually pull something like that off is just well, mind-boggling to me you know the other side of that let's think back biosphere 2 and folks out here if you don't know what biosphere 2 is we live in biosphere 1 google it look at the history of biosphere 2 there's a great book out there called two years and 20 minutes written by one of the people who was in the initial crew at biosphere 2 and text talks about the group and how they developed and what they did uh, it's, it's an amazing feat to have been able to do what they did and there's still some amazing research that's going on in that facility now. I believe, and my Tucson folks can correct me, but I think that U of A uh, owns. I'm not. I wouldn't Biosphere be surprised. Too I would not at be this time. I, yeah. I know that there's. Well, it's it's changed hands a couple of times because it to make it financially viable today is much harder because it is like the the SR seventy one. It's made with older technology. It's a great modern forward-looking idea but it was done with older technology sure and they had to cobble and work up and and now it's very hard to to maintain any of that one of kind of technology yeah interesting stuff yeah that that it just absolutely fascinated me when i started reading about about that i was thinking oh my goodness can you imagine being in that area of what was it 20 people no it wasn't even the the, no. cr the crew that was inside i think was eight was it eight? Yeah, oh wow i think it was eight okay <laughs> i want to say it was eight I'm, I'm not gonna swear to that eight or 12 comes to mind yeah, it may have, yeah okay, it, it's it may a have. small number yeah and uh, what's interesting about it that they um they broke into two factions yep and some of those people never talked again. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was that yeah, it I've... was that intense. And it shows us a lot of things about um, what it does when people are put in those kinds of close proximities. It's one of the issues that here I'm going to take a really left field that submariners have to deal with because they have intense closed populations for periods of time not two years you know but a good amount of time that they are out under the water having to be quiet and having to do this and having to do that sure. and following a whole bunch of rules and very different personalities and it's not easy it's not easy to be that intense with somebody and you, you, you know, there's no way to not share things in that closed an environment. Sure, sure. And all of those little idiosyncrasies that we all have get on each other's nerves. Well, and you even hear that from sailors who are out for a year, say, on an aircraft carrier. Yeah. And you can imagine, okay, the submariners are in just such an enclosed area yeah. that just magnifies it even more. Well, and, and the... The sailors on the carriers, they do put into port here and there, and they do get a day here or there away from their their friends mm -hmm. and co-workers. Sure. Whereas a, a, a mariner can't do that, a submariner. Yeah. So, yeah. A lot of my hats off to, uh, yeah, when Admiral Rickover was first putting together the submarine force, he was quite a character himself. Uh one of his most famous questions that he liked to ask people was, do you mean to tell me I should trust one of my precious reactors to an idiot like you? <laughs> and, you know, how do you answer that kind of question? Okay. How do you answer that kind of question? To an admiral. Yeah. To an admiral. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Respectfully. Well, uh, right? It's not exactly Lieutenant JG, is it? Yeah. 
<laughs> However, the person talking to him probably is. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Or even lower. Or even lower. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So they're trying to make sure that you can take a, an element of, that was his philosophy, to make sure you could take some amount of abuse and not lose your cool. That's an art form. Yeah. It is. It is. So that's as good a place as any to launch into something else that I had planned on talking about today. One of the things that we are invited to do in the course of the Omer, the traveling between Passover, Pesach, and Shavuot, and we're into the lighter part of that. It's pretty heavy through the first 33 days. And after Lagba Omer, the 33rd day of the Omer, it starts to lighten up, and we're now in the 30s the upper 30s of the days. And so the mood is starting to lighten. But one of the things that we're invited to do during that period is a kind of a self-examination to look at your different qualities. What are your strengths? What, are you, what makes you angry? What makes you loving? What makes you strong? What makes you compassionate? You know, how do you, what do you do that's, that's building up a foundation of life? So those kinds of examinations, you know, how, what strengths do you have? And there's a, there's a technique that's used in analyzing businesses called SWOT, mm -hmm. S-W-O-T, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And that's, I think, a great way for people to do kind of a self-tally and see where you are in life and whether or not your long-term goals match up with where you're at and what you need to shift. What additional strengths do you need to develop? What weaknesses do you need to work on? And, you know, what opportunities should you be looking at and what threats should you guard against? So it's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Strengths and weaknesses are about you. They're the things you're good at, the things that you love to do, the things that you're passionate about. Those are strengths. The weaknesses are the things, uh, you know, perhaps temper for some people, um, perhaps a computer phobia for others, uh, technology. Guilty as charged. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of those kinds of things, right? Yeah. Everybody's got different strengths and weaknesses. There are people who are, you know, love technology, and and that might actually even be a weakness if you're too too techy, or if you're, uh, or if your technology is game playing on the on the tablet. Um, because it goes all different ways. I love that about my Chinese students. I'll say to them, what's your favorite class? And they'll say to me, computer class. And I'll say, why? You know, what do you like about computer? Oh, I play games. Yeah. Like, that's Naturally. Not, that's not quite, you know. Problem is your IRC kids would <laughs> probably say the same thing. <laughs> no, I'm Some sorry. of them, no, you know, what can oh. I say? Semester is, summer semester, summer A has started. Yep. It started this past week. We're a couple of days into it. Which reminds me, I need to post the Zoom class for <gasps> for that class. There you go. The Collaborate class. <laughs> so how many students do you have in the summertime? I have one class this summer, this semester, and it has 30 students in it. Wow. So. All right. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And they're just, just uh, looking around and starting to read their textbooks and. I'm a little bit gentle. I give a little bit of a, an extension on the first assignments, and then they come pretty rapid fire because we've only got six weeks to work with. Sure. It's a very high tense, and most students only take one or two classes. A couple of gluttons for punishment take three. That's like taking six in a regular semester because they're folded on themselves. And you know, if you're not really good at writing, philosophy courses are not good to take in summer. <laughs> because there's a lot of writing that goes on in philosophy courses. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's just my pe my recommendation. If you need time to write, then you need to, to pace it out. But more and more of school is going to the shorter semesters because it, in the long run, it's easier on students. And your major universities are doing the same thing. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah absolutely. So getting back to it, strengths and weaknesses, those are internal and uh, positive and negative, right? constructive and uh, obstructive, and not destructive, but obstructive. Little mm -hmm. difference. No, there is. And then externally are the opportunities. What, what's happening in the world that you can 
exploit that you can take advantage of that you can use in connection with your strengths in order to make a meaningful contribution, gainful employment, etc. And what are the threats? What are the things that are going to hold you back? What are the obstacles? And those are both external. Opportunities and threats are external, positive and negative again. So that's a way of looking at what's going on in your life. It's a, it's a relatively quick analysis to do. Companies do it all the time. In fact, uh, for the big companies, you can Google it and find a SWOT analysis that somebody's done for some paper or other and published out. There's a, I think, uh, Yahoo Financial does a SWOT mm -hmm. analysis that people can look at for the big companies. And if you uh, uh, are locally on the Treasure Coast, I mean, uh, the uh, SBDC at uh, IRSC uh, does that with every every one of the businesses they deal with. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a ver and it's, the point though is that you can do that as an individual because sure. you are a corporation of one. Mm -hmm. You're an organization of one. Your family is an organization of however many are in your family. And so this kind of an analysis can be done at any level. It can be done at an individual. It can be done as a family. It can be done a community. Yeah, you certainly don't have to be a business, that's yeah. for sure. Any organization can do it. Yeah. And it's a good way of looking at it. The other thing that I like to do, and we've talked about this, I haven't talked about it in a while, are what are called the right questions. Now, that it's not right because R-I-G-H-T, but it's named for the person who came up with the sequence, the right questions. And those are, uh, what, is, what, what is right with the current situation? What, what's going well in what's going on? What would be the ideal situation? That's question two. So number one, what's, what's really happening, or mm -hmm. what's right with what's happening? Part two, what would be the best thing that could What's the best scenario? The panacea. Uh, well, I, maybe not, not a quite. panacea. Not but, quite. But, but, but you know, yeah. the, what, what would be fantastic? And then what's the gap between what is <laughs> and what would be ideal? Right. And then how do you get there? Yeah. What's it going to take and how long is it going to take to bridge that gap? And those are really powerful questions. And when you come at something that way, what you avoid is the, the pity me party. You avoid the, the pitfalls of looking at the problem because what you've done is the kind of thing that I talk about with crossing the reed sea with Moses, which is that if you stare at the Egyptians, you're never going to see the water parting. You've got to turn around and be looking for solutions and not staring at the problem and crying. It, there's a, you know, everybody needs to cry some amount, understand. But the goal has to be, how do I get to where I need to be? How do I get from where I am to where I want to, should, need to be? Mm -hmm. And the reality is that we can do that. We can absolutely improve the situation and move ourselves toward that idea. We may not achieve it, but we can certainly get a lot closer than if we don't try to move. If we just sit and stare at the problem, then guess what? We're going to have the same problem tomorrow and the next day and the next right. day and the next day and the next day. And then it's going to be a year later and nothing's changed. Those are the kinds of issues. If we don't look, if we don't have a forward looking piece all the time, and I mean all the time. We're not going to move forward. If we just sit and say, oh, this is what we've got. Yep. You know, yeah, I've got peanut butter and jelly today. And uh, I don't like that, but I've got peanut butter and jelly today. And you stop at that point. You're not going to have anything different down the road, except you might run out of jelly and just have a peanut butter sandwich. But Has the pandemic done that to some people? It has. Some people are just staring at the pandemic. and Yeah. They're not thinking that pandemics do come and go yes there will be a new normal hopefully we'll have learned to wash our hands better time will tell as always it has in the past and it will now as well are we going to learn to wear masks during flu season and whatever ends up being the high covid season 
That's my fear. I think COVID's going to become kind of like the flu. Well, and we will have COVID uh, yearly shots just like we have flu shots. Probably. That's my or guess. Or maybe a combination of all of the above. Yeah. It's probably going to be two shots because why not? Money, money. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and they may not work well together. Yeah, well, that, okay. That's the other possibility. You right. bet. They may not work well together and your body might need some time after having learned how to deal with the new flu viruses that we hope are the ones that grow and the new COVID viruses that come up. And, and I have mentioned it before. Coronaviruses are not new. We've had corona kind of, it's the name of the shape of the virus is corona. It has a certain shape. And, and now graphics are out there with little coronavirus uh, artwork on it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I've certainly noticed that penetration into. Uh, well, and Dr. Scheib talks about that, you know, it, it's been around in China for thousands of years. Uh, we've been vaccinating dogs against a canine. It's, in fact, it's called canine coronavirus, CCV. And if you look at your dog's vaccine record, it may it probably includes CCV for the last 15, 20 years. Wow. Yeah. Before I moved to Tucson, we were already vaccinating for coronavirus in dogs. Now, they cannot infect humans. Right. And dogs don't catch our, the COVID-19. But, yeah, coronaviruses have been around and will be around. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's so true. But, and yeah. Pe you know, people ask why China? Because it's a very, very old, old, old population. I don't mean that the people living there are old, but there has been civilization sure. in Chinese areas, uh, particularly along the coast and up rivers, which is where people tend to migrate to for millennia, not just decades and not just centuries, but millennia. Mm -hmm. right. Sure. So it's been around for a long time. Yeah. And uh, so it's a very, very old culture and... Viruses have been around, bacteria have been around, all kinds of things have been around, and some of them attack us. You know, look at, you know, we live in a part where citrus greening, that's a virus. And it's very, very hard, once it gets established somewhere, to eliminate it. Which is why they burn it. Right. But it's kind of hard to burn people, and nor do we want oh, to. Oh, well, yeah. It's a whole yeah. different story. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it might explain why some older rituals, some older, older um, cultures do have burning rituals for bodies. It's the, the, there's a line in, in the book of Amos about going into, the, into your uncle's house with the man who burns the bodies. Ooh. So really? Yeah. So burning is not new. Of course India India does that. Does yeah. uh yeah. funeral pyres. It's where that description comes from. Some Native Americans mm -hmm. have uh burning funerary rituals. So yeah. Maybe that's part of why. As I was explained in my congregation, that might be one of the reasons why when you handle a dead body in scriptures time you were supposed to stay away from the rest of the community for a period of time perhaps to see if you develop sy symptoms Ooh, yeah pandemics have been around a long time it doesn't mean we should be casual about them it just means we need to learn what to do to keep the majority of the people safe and it is it's a numbers thing and i'm sorry and I'm not trying to make light of those. I, uh, I've, I've lost family members to it. Not, thank you, God, not close family members. And I certainly know many people who have lost close family members. And, um, and I know you do as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So there needs to be compassion for that. And, and when we talk about these kinds of numbers, and, and God willing that I'll survive it, you know, God willing, I'll survive 95. God willing, all of those things. You know, there's lots of, lots of opportunities to get ourselves in trouble. 
physically, emotionally, etc. So we do need to use things like vaccines to be as smart as we can. That's a, a threat countermeasure. So right now, if we do a, 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 a SWOT analysis of ourselves, one of the threats that's out there is COVID. Yes. It's what, and also what it's doing to the economy. Okay. It's drastically changing some industries. Some industries are benefiting from it. Some are getting windfalls and others are, are struggling and, and even going out of business. And you know, what will it look like in a year, two, five years? Much harder to guess right now. I was talking to uh, a restaurant owner uh, just two days ago, and she said, I need nine people. And she said, our business is exploding. Mm-hmm. But I do not have enough workers. Yeah, they were they were talking about that on the news between uh, Stewart's show and my sure. show, and they were talking about people making more money on it, which is sad, right? If two hundred dollars extra on unemployment benefits is enough to make you your life better than when you were working, my gosh. That's, and, and I recognize both sides of that. I was the manager of a flower shop for a while when I first finished college. And I remember tr- struggling with how, how many hours could I give people and stay profitable? Mm-hmm. Could I stay within the budget of what we were likely to generate for income? And that's, a, it's a, I'm not saying that's easy. That's an extremely hard thing to do when you've got a profit margin that's tight and the small companies their profit margins are tight they become looser the bigger you are because you can have one person doing bigger jobs so you get better value quote unquote out of a unit but the small business that has to pay a a full-time person and the minimum wages is a challenge. I agree. On the other hand, the person who works for you needs to be able to have a good lifestyle. They need, they need to be able to pay rent and put food on the table and have basic medical care. And that's a tough balance. And it makes it really, really hard for the small business. It's not hard for the big business. Big business, Costco is an example of not paying people minimum wage. Yeah, realize what what minimum wage it's yeah that's not a ton of money folks right and you're talking 52 weeks and you know let's let's take very round numbers and i'll give you a feel for it if you work 40 hours a week and you make ten dollars an hour and you can tell where that is on the scale of minimum wage or not then you're making four hundred dollars a week not too exorbitant no Twenty some thousand dollars a year. Mm-hmm. So if you're working, you know, if if you're working lower than twenty some thousand a year, you're working at or below minimum wage. And those are the kinds of numbers that businesses need to be aware of and need to understand. Yeah. As Sharon says, I I make less money teaching than being on unemployment. She went back to teaching. Kudos to you. People, Whoa, people congratulations. Are making, yeah, people are making that decision because they want to be at work. They want to be doing things. And, um, yeah. If, if a $200 a week addition is more than what you were making... Um, you got problems. You know, and and it's a societal problem. Yeah, we've got problems. We've this got problems, society. not you. Yeah, yeah. Right. We've got problems because we've got a very large population that's barely, barely making it, or almost making it. It's probably closer. Yeah, we've got groups that have to group together in order to be able to pay rent. Right. The Treasure Coast is not a low rent area, and nor is California for that matter. Uh, Tucson's becoming that way. Tucson's got much better rental properties, though, because they've got a lot of older properties. 
you see the median price in California for oh, it's a house crazy. is seven hundred thousand? I'm yeah. going what? Yeah, I, I don't understand how anybody lives out there anymore. Uh, well, Amazing. they're they're losing people because of that. Sure, obviously, yeah. And um, yeah, the old homesteads become really valuable. Yeah, and I know some people who really benefited. The families bought the homes long ago, and the kids benefit from it. Yeah, yeah, it's. That's the case where the population increased too fast for the resources. And so the prices went through the roof. It's supply mm -hmm. and demand. It's not surprising. We're seeing a little bit of that with the lowering of mortgage rates. Then the housing market is kind of exploding. Not kind of, but it is exploding. And But that's changing because of, again, going back to the pandemic, that the governor in the state of Washington won't allow any lumbering uh, and has not for a year. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine the supply of lumber is really getting thin around yeah. the United States. Yeah. Well, it makes it easier and perhaps better to do concrete or uh, cinder block construction. Yeah. I did see there's, it surprised me that I have seen some timber construction in the Port St. Lucie area. I didn't know that was allowed, but hmm. we watched a set of apartment houses, decent looking apartment houses going up in the, mm -hmm. and there would. I would have thought everything has to be, uh, you know, cinder block, but. I would have assumed that, but maybe not. Apparently not, because I can't imagine somebody could get the permits to build sure. if it wasn't allowed. And we'll, we're going to assume <laughs> that they aren't doing something as public public as an apartment house without having permits so <laughs> oh oh no you know that they're there yeah yeah, yeah. E even though i didn't check and see the yeah there was something the on the uh, nowhere briefing this morning of uh, another two what was it 283 apartment units going in uh, just by tiffany and us1 uh, oh wow that, that area brand new ones um, it's a 50, what is it, $58 million project or something. Wow, so trying to revitalize the Highway 1 yeah. area yeah. corridor. Yeah. That'll be interesting. Yeah. Of course, obviously, we've got the explosion going on in, in and around the tradition oh, area. Like crazy. Yeah. Absolutely like crazy. And the infill in my own neighborhood, where my own neighbor, my neighborhood used to be, oh, maybe half houses and half undeveloped lots. Yeah, there's only a handful of undeveloped lots now. Yeah, well, lots and, of infilling. And I remember uh, uh, the major fire, brush fire that we had in the '90s, and it was, uh, you know, uh, it was crazy. And I think there was like 40 uh, homes that were affected, and um, and of course now all of that what was open brush area in western Port St. Lucie, it's all homes now. Yeah, more and more. And uh, Sharon is telling me that gas is running about $5 a gallon. Yeah, well. In San Diego. Well, Sharon, just keep waiting because uh, <laughs> if uh, the new transportation secretary gets his way, it'll be $7 a gallon very soon. Mm. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It's yeah. just crazy. Yeah, and, 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 and what's going to be interesting is um, you know, the state of Oregon now is doing a mileage tax. Are you aware of that? No. Because of all the electric cars up there. Ah, uh, because they don't get enough gas. The gas taxes are going down, so now they're coming up with something else. And it's, I think you're paying, is it 1000 or 2000 a year? Uh, in Oregon to uh, for the privilege of having a driver's license. Wow. It's like, oh, my goodness. Yeah. It is a privilege. Oh, yeah. yeah and it is. It is. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, and then the other side is, I was driving through Tradition the other day, and there's that little driverless. Oh, yeah. Little, the little. Uh, that little bus. Little tram. Thing. Yeah, the tram thing. Yeah coming through so well and supposedly by 2030 we will uh have uh, driverless cars out there yeah. general motors is committed to it and of course uh we were listening to a guy from ford at the broadcasters convention a few
few years back, and 2030 was their target date for Ford. It's going to happen. I think that it, it as we have a problem now of people texting and driving, and it's against the law to do it. People still do it, and you see it all the time, and you, know, you see people fumbling with their tablets. And, you know, I know that I use my map on my, you know, I plug in the phone and I use the GPS yep, on the yep, phone. Yep, so do we. And, uh, of course, that's sitting there and talking to me because the display is, among other things, not even usable to really look at. So it's, it's more just telling you uh, rights and left turns. But um, there's a ton of that going on. And driverless cars are the answer to that then you can be texting and doing your work or playing your game or sleeping on the way into and from work well it's going to change the commute as we've seen on um, uh, trips down the uh, turnpike up around tallahassee and gainesville in that area uh the new uh, driverless trucks are out there mm-hmm. and it, it's weird to look up and do a semi and don't see anybody in there mm-hmm. um apparently the experiments are working okay yeah it's a little scary to me but yeah. it's a ton of weight going at a good volume of speed yeah and uh, yeah let's get back to your plant sale back to my plant sale okay one last one last uh promotion on that and let me also invite people to sponsor a, a and ask the rabbi session you Please bet. contact the radio station we certainly could use sponsors well well, thank you for doing it, and I do want to give a shout-out on that note for the plant sale. A thank you to Jim Kane and Sandra Wishnia because they are adding to the sponsorship of it and to Suzanne Brando for sponsoring the space at the community center for the sale. Nice, nice. So we do have some supporters for that, and um, yeah. And that will be on the 30th? On the 30th, Sunday from 2 to 5, and the doors will not open until 2. Now, we're not going to be in the room that we've been in when you first come into the community center. We're going to be off to the left, and we'll I think we'll be able to open the door right to the outside to the parking lot. Oh, nice. It's, it's an area that was used for children. It's one of their, and, and until COVID is over enough to bring the kids back in. It's one of the spaces available. So we'll be off to the left and down the hall from the entrance. So, yeah, on the 30th. All right. Two to well, five. That's going to be neat. It that's will be. be Thank you so much. I wish everyone a really great week. And enjoy wherever you are. Enjoy something, something beautiful. This is Rabbi Shafir Loeb, and it has been Ask a Rabbi on WPSLWSTU right here in Port St. Lucie. Well, Fort Pierce. Have a good week. You've been listening to Ask a Rabbi right here on WPSL, Port St. Lucie. Talk of the Treasure Coast, webcaster to the world. It's 12 noon.